Good morning, everyone. Good morning. A lot of talking going on back there. <laughs> Welcome um, to Plateau Community Church. May the grace and peace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ be with each and every one of you as we worship today. And we have a special commemoration uh, All Saints service for those that have gone before us in the past year. Uh, there are a few announcements. A Women of Faith are meeting tomorrow night at 5.30. Um, Wednesday, uh, we are hosting the um, Freddy Ford Senior Lunch here at Plateau. That's at noon. Uh, our next Lincoln Circle meeting uh, is November 23rd. And it would really encourage me if there were more people from Plateau that showed up so I wouldn't have to be the only one representing the church. So I invite you to come and be part of that. It's 10 o'clock. It's going to be at Pisgah Methodist in Lincolnton. And then uh, our third Lincolnton Circle uh, youth event is happening that same day uh, in the afternoon from 3.30 to 5.30, um, and, or 3 to 5, rather, excuse me, and that's being held at David's Chapel over in <coughs> Laurel. Well, you know where it is. It's over there that way. And uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for uh, children and youth to come together, to fellowship together, to have some good food together, and to um, uh, run around, have some fun playing some games together. So I invite you all to come and be a part of that. And then the last thing is, uh, each year we typically get together with three other churches in the community and do an ecumenical Thanksgiving service. Uh, this year it's going to be on Wednesday night, uh, the 27th, that's the day before Thanksgiving. Um, and it will be hosted at Ebenezer United Methodist Church in Vail. Our responsibility is to bring drinks. Each church has a responsibility to bring uh, something for a, a meal that we have and then uh, we move to a, a worship service. So the meal will start at 6 o'clock and the worship service will be at 7. Are there any other announcements? I have one regarding the senior citizen meeting that's here on a Wednesday. It is the annual picnic which means you simply bring yourself and enjoy the fellowship. We absolutely ask you to bring nothing. That's the annual thing that we do when we just go to the park. And this is the same event except it's, it's the chicken meals, the fried chicken that's brought here, and um, some of it's prepared here. But it's like just a joyous time to be together. So I'd like to see Platon really support this this way. I'd like to see you support everyone. Come show, show up. Show them that you care about how many church in the community. Mm -hmm. And that's at 12. 12 o'clock dots when you start to begin the Bring yourself. Thank you, Lisa. Any other announcements? Well, if not, I invite you to uh, rise if you're able and join in our call to worship.
pray. Oh God, you are our God. We seek you, we thirst for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. The struggles of the week just past have left our spirits parched. By your spirit, lead us to drink deeply from the river of your delights. Let us feast on the abundance of your household. Shelter us beneath the shadow of your wings. Be present in your gathered people, that we may behold your beauty and be restored by your love. We pray this all in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Please join in our opening hymn for all the saints.
As we do each Sunday morning, as we come together as the body of Christ, we take a few moments to share our joys and our concerns. So I invite you, uh, if you have a joy or a concern, to allow the Spirit to move accordingly. family 
um, as they grieve uh, her loss. We, we all, were all so helpful Thursday night. Joyce shared a, a text that she received that the procedure went great. Um, but then I guess something happened and where they put the stent in, uh, it, it bled. So please be with that family. Pray, pray for that family. So her body has been donated to, to science and research. Pastor Peter, yes. congregation, all of you know my sister Colleen, I think you do. Uh, she's been uh, ailing over the last two or three months with forgetfulness. But anyway, she's been to the doctor and they've determined that. Uh, She's like the rest of us that forget things, but anyway. Lydia, her husband, is an Italian, and he, he is religiously uh, attached to the Catholic Church for All Saints Day, which is Friday. So he flew over two weeks ago to be with his daughter and, and grandchildren, and three days later, he acquired COVID. She did not go because she just hasn't been feeling well. I tried to talk her into staying with us and her, I'll be fine. Well, make a long story short, she gets sick this past week with a horrible upper respiratory infection. And I finally convinced her to come and stay with us, and she did. She came Friday, early Friday, and um, we had one of the best times together that we've had in our lifetime. Uh, we took her to the play at the uh, Run, the Adams family that's going on right now. If any of you haven't seen it, you next weekend to play it again. But it was just a joy, like Wayne and I have, have not had in a long time for uh, with the three of us together. And with that, keep Livio in your prayers. He's supposed to be flying in late this evening from England. There's no. Uh, he doesn't have to change planes, but he does have to stop at one trip. I think it's in Washington or somewhere like that. <clears throat> Keep them in your prayers. So, now, Pastor Peter, I have a praise this morning. I sit up here every Sunday morning, and it's just not generally by myself as a man. No chance. So generally, Wesley, at least for there was you. So, uh, I'm not I'm not alone up here. And that loneliness is something that it's it's. It's an inner feeling, you know. As I look out this morning, and I sit up here and I look over the church, I see something so beautiful. I see friends that I haven't seen in years. And saints have the ability to unite us and to sit and to separate us. We all gather in the house of the Lord to love and celebrate the ones who went before us. It does my heart so good inside. Mm -hmm. I've been going to church here. It's something years. What a wonderful blessing this Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Wayne. <laughs> Any other joys or concerns? Well, let's pray. Most gracious, loving, and eternal God, we thank you for your presence here amongst us this morning. We thank you for this day that you blessed us with, and thank you. Uh, for allowing us to have the opportunity to uh, remember those saints that have gone before us. Lord, uh, for those that are, are struggling with various illnesses, whether it be COVID or um, other respiratory diseases, uh, be with them, uh, extend your healing touch to them that they might uh, recover and be healed. Uh, for those that have experienced a, a loss of a loved one, Lord, I ask that you be with each one of them uh, and give them peace and comfort uh, as they grieve that loss. Lord, we're so grateful to have the opportunity to come together and we're so grateful, Lord, that um, the church is, is filled this morning with, with saints, living saints um, that have come uh, to be part of, of this service this morning. So Lord, we ask that you uh, bless this time, bless this service, allow us to uh, 
give you all praise, glory, and honor as we worship you. And as we close this time of prayer, Lord, we close it with the words that your Son Jesus gave us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. I invite our children and youth to come forward for your message. message that Louise L. has prepared uh, through you, Lord. May it uh, be a message that inspires their minds and opens their hearts. We pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. It was a joy to see you at Trick or Treat. Wasn't that fun? Yeah. Really fun. I want us to look at a, a special scripture from the book of Ephesians, the fourth chapter. <clears throat> Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. Is it difficult for you to forgive someone? Is it? Sometimes it's hard, isn't it? What makes you angry to not want to forgive them? What, do, what, what are some ugly things that we do to other people? Let's just think, let's put it on the table, and it's okay. What are some ugly things that we think sometimes <coughs> cute that we do to others that hurt them? Ugly words? What are some of those words? Oh, what are they? Ugly? Stupid. I just asked, told you too. What are some others? You dress crazy. We must say that. I don't like that outfit. You shouldn't wear that again. Oh, I have more than you. Ever done that? I don't like your candy. You don't share it with, with me, but you share with others. Does that make them feel good? Do you like for people to tell you those things? <clears throat> Why not? Why not? It hurts, doesn't it? It hurts. So what is the solution to that? <clears throat> what are some things that we can do? What are some physical signs that we can do to make that person feel better? If we have been the one to do the other words, what does this mean? Good? Thumbs up? Keep the good work up? What else? How about this? What does that mean? Hello? Or bye, right? Back when my children were in high school and I decided to be a brave mother working at part-time job with the Employment Security Commission, I volunteered to drive the school bus. And one day in the evening, I was dispensing Alan Levin's children on Highway 10 at the Mildred Weaver home, and I had a stop sign out. And 
was ready to open the door, an oncoming car blew its horn and gave me that ugly sign from the foot hand, that middle finger. And I gently opened the door, and they continued to do that. And the students, the riders, began to say, Miss Hedgepath, did you see that? I said, I did. But this is what we're going to do. And as I closed the door, I did this. And I continued with my hand as, as we trolled it along. And one little youngster from the back proceeded to say, oh, she gave them all five. <laughs> No. I gave them the love because I wanted them to know that Jesus is operating this bus, not Lois Hill. That never happened to me again, but I couldn't imagine what in the world would somebody drive a car dispensing two or three young children and doing that kind of action. But see, I had to, and I might be a first time. But I had to overcome that to ask God to forgive. And we have to work on that. Um, forgiving each other just as Christ forgave us. Listen, can you imagine someone, someone sacrificing their life for you? But that's what's happened. God gave us Christ, Jesus to save us from that kind of ugly stuff. We're to be kind, and we're to learn to use nice, kind words, even sometimes when we are so angry, whether that means with your friends, your classmates, or your brother or your sister. And sometimes that gets kind of testy, doesn't it? Uh, Mommy took my toy. Right? It's mine. And that's okay because there is a heavenly Father that forgives us as we ask Him to forgive us. And then you can breathe and simply say, Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we pray for these children that have gathered here. And we thank, thank you for your almighty power that's uh, beyond our understanding. But we thank you and praise you for it. And now we ask you to continue to be with us as we go through this worship service. Amen. Um, I go to Children's Church. This weekend we observe All Saints Day and we're invited to remember those saints who walked among us, just plain ordinary people with extraordinary faith. These saints are not distant, nor are they perfect, but they're real individuals who shared Christ's light and they left a profound impact on all our lives and as well as the community. Like Paul's Corinthian saints, they remind us that God uses each of us with all our strengths and all our flaws to make a difference in the lives of others. So I ask you, who would you light a candle for today? Who's walked with you, encouraged your faith, or shown you the love of Christ in a way that you'll never, ever 
to get. Anybody like to share? My grandmother. My grandmother. Bill and Margaret Duty. My sister Suburban Jones and Sister King Wilson. So when we stop and think about it, there are saints living amongst us that have encouraged us, showed us the path, maybe pushed us on a little bit in a way that maybe we were reluctant to go. They're all saints. And as you remember last week, we are all saints, even though we might sin just a little bit here and there. So I'd like to offer a prayer for these saints and for the light that they have left with us. These particular saints, Josie Ledford, Junior Loman, and Nancy Wright. Loving God, today we give thanks for the saints who have gone before us, those who walked in faith, shared your love, and showed us what it means to follow Jesus. We remember those who shaped our lives, encouraged our spirits, and pointed us toward you. And now as we light candles in their memory, let their light remind us of your presence with us always. May their legacy inspire us to live with courage, with faith, with compassion, and carrying forward the light of Christ in our own lives. We ask that you fill us with the same spirit of grace and love that we might be a blessing to others, just as they were to us. Grant us the strength to continue their good work and the peace of knowing they rest now in your eternal care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'd like to invite the family of Josie Ledford to come to light a candle in her name. Now I invite the family of Junior Loman to come forward to light the candle in his memory.
and the family of Nancy Roots. I invite them to come forward. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, good and gracious God, we thank you for this opportunity to remember these dear saints. Lord, for Josie Ledford, for Junior Loman, and for Nancy Wright. Lord, may the light that is shining bright uh, before us uh, be a light that always is impregnated on our mind as a reminder of their love and the joy that they brought us here on earth. Lord, be with each member of the family that have come out today. Bless them, keep them, we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for all the blessings that you shower down upon us. We take the opportunity now, Lord, to just give back to you a portion of all that you bless us with. And we present to you our tithes and our offerings. We ask that you anoint them and bless them. Make them be for us a means of expanding your kingdom, not only here in the local area, but throughout the world. And we pray all this in the precious and loving name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Because today I want to talk about God's will versus our will. We're taught from the Bible that God gives us free will. 
it's ours to choose. And sometimes we choose what is good in the will of God. And then there's other times we choose what is dead wrong. And I pray this message will try to answer a few of your questions. But before we begin, first let me tell you how God's will has affected me. When God called me to the ministry, I'll admit that I struggled. I struggled. I thought surely that God had made a mistake. I certainly wasn't good enough. <laughs> I wasn't smart enough. I wasn't kind enough or pure enough to be a minister for God. But I ended up having many talks with God over about a 18 year or so period before I surrendered to his call on my life. I had questions. God, I'm not smart enough to pastor a church when old people in that church know the Bible by heart. How am I going to ever teach them anything? Or, God, what if you call me to serve down south in the Bible Belt. You're just a New England boy. I'll certainly be way, way, way over my head. What about that? And if seminary is the answer to gain my knowledge, where am I going to get the money for that? I wanted to do God's will, but what was it? I didn't want to make a mistake with my life. How could I be certain which choice was God's best for my future? Have you been there before? Some decisions are painless, like what am I going to wear today? Or what am I going to have for lunch? But many decisions are life-altering. Should I apply this to this college or maybe to that one? Should I marry this person or consider someone else? Should I accept this job? Should I buy a house? You see, our life is a sum of the choices that we make. So let's talk about how much God wants to be involved in us making all those decisions. The big ones and the little ones. We begin with a lot of questions. And Paul tells us in Ephesians 1, verses 4 to 6, that God knew before the earth was formed, or even before time began, even before Adam and Eve walked in the garden, God was preparing for you. Not only was he planning for you, but he chose you. And you might have thought you chose him. He chose you. The term which theology uses is predestination. But what exactly does that mean? So, do we have a free will to choose for ourselves? Or has God already done that and we just don't have a say in the matter? How do we balance these things? Do we have any choice or is every aspect of our lives already been predetermined by God? Well, let's look at a quick breakdown by looking at some key phrases that Paul uses. In verse 4 he says, we're chosen in Christ. God chose us in Him. We're not chosen apart from Christ. We're not chosen by God for anything we've done or we would contribute to His kingdom. Being chosen by God is wrapped up in our relationship with Christ. We still sin, but we're forgiven in Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. Just, just 
In verse 5, he says, we're adopted as his sons. In Paul's time, only sons were eligible to be heirs and to be granted the authority and the privileges and resources of the Father. By choosing men and women as his sons, God is making them all equal heirs. God adopted us for himself. That is, he adopted us for a relationship with him. Whether we choose to accept that relation is still up to us. What does all this mean to us? Does God choose us even if we don't want him to? Does God choose some people, but not others? How can you know what God's will and purposes are? This certainly is a difficult passage of Scripture. And that's why Paul called it this mystery. Even today, we as Christians want a full understanding and an explanation concerning the relationship between God's so sovereign will and our own free will. Keep in mind that Paul was very, very educated. And even though he was very intelligent, he found out that he couldn't comprehend the infinite depths of God's wisdom. So keeping all that in mind, Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4, and said that God sent his son so that we could be adopted as sons and become heirs. I want to read from Romans chapter 11, verses, verses 34 to 36. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been, in, been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. So instead of being bewildered by God's greatness, Paul just starts praising him. So how do we relate to the mightiness of God? Just know that God has an answer to every difficult question that comes along in your life. He knows the future. He knows why he created you. He understands how he uniquely designed each one of us. And he knows your strengths. And guess what? He knows your weaknesses too. We may not fully understand what God is doing in our lives, but certain things about God can be known. Scripture is very clear that God is love. He is full of grace and mercy toward us. So in these moments when we don't understand or we can't comprehend, we can trust that He will work out all those moments in ways that are consistent with His character. And then we praise Him for it. That's why we're here at this very moment, this morning, here in this sanctuary, to praise God. But let's change gears here for a moment. Let me read again from Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore I urge you, brothers, and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. It says, be transformed, or be changed. That 
That's what we need today. Among the young and the old alike. We need a change. We need a spiritual change. We need a moral change. We seem to have gotten off of track. And God calls on all of us to make a total surrender to His Son, Jesus Christ. If you want a change in your life, if you want forgiveness and peace and joy that you've never known before, God demands total surrender. He becomes the Lord and the ruler of your life. And I think many of us just don't get it. We don't get to fully experience all that God has for us because we don't totally surrender to Him. Remember, I've already said that God adopted us to be His sons and His daughters. He chose us in Christ to be holy and blameless according to the pleasure of His will. It's God's will for us to be His. But there's another part to that. It's our choice to obey and accept it. I've had many surgeries over the course of my two or three hundred years. And I don't negotiate with the doctors as they take out their scalpels and put the anesthetic in. I put my full trust in those doctors that they're going to do the right thing. God said, I know the plans for you, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. You know where that comes from. Some God by the name of Jeremiah, chapter 29, verse 11. That's what God says. He's not here to condemn you. He's here to bless you and love you and take you into his arms and say, I forgive you. I'm going to change your life. And when you die, guess what? You're going to go to heaven. That's what God is saying. If you'll just surrender totally and completely. But you can't hold anything back. So how do you do that? Well, first you surrender your mind. Now, when you surrender your mind to God, it means not only what we think, but how we think. You see, there are two forces inside of you. One is satanic, and one is of God. Don't let the devil corrupt your mind. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Philippians 2, verse 5. Second, surrender your body. One of the great debates today is, who owns the body? Doctors, lawyers, clergy, presidential candidates, judges, and juries all debate the moral, ethical, and legal sides of the issue. And the question surrounding suicide and euthanasia, and especially in the last year or so, abortion, set on the issues of who owns and controls your body. Who controls your body? Did you know the Bible says if you're a Christian, your body doesn't belong to you? It belongs to God. And the Bible also says that it's God's temple. Your body is God's temple and He dwells in you if you really know Christ. 1 Corinthians 3.16 says, Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? And that's why I love being a Christian. Jesus said, You must be born again. 
John chapter 3, verse 7. You can start all over with a brand new life. He'll forgive all the past and give you power for the future. Your heart can be changed. It's changed through prayer. It's changed through the Bible. It's changed by listening to the Holy Spirit. And by the way, don't think that you're the lone ranger when it comes to temptation. Everybody is tempted. The devil tempts everybody, every single one of us. I've been tempted hundreds of times, and so have you. Temptation isn't sin. It's when you yield to that temptation that it becomes sin. Christ died to give you a new heart and a new desire, so surrender your mind and your body. And last, surrender your will. We've talked a lot about God's will this morning. Now let's talk a little about surrendering our will. Before Jesus healed or helped people, he would normally say, will you? Or are you willing? And I'm asking, will you surrender to Christ? Will you let Christ dominate your life and be the Lord of your life? Will you? That's a question that he asks. The scripture says, whosoever will, let him come. Revelation 22, 17. If you choose to do so, you can do that by saying this simple prayer. Lord, I will receive you into my heart today. Forgive me of my past, the things that I've done wrong. Forgive me of my past, the things all the things that I've done. I want you to give me a new direction and a brand new start in my life. I want you to fill up this empty place in my life. And that too is why I love being a Christian. No matter what I've done, no matter how bad I think I am, Jesus can turn it all around if I let him, if I surrender to him. If I throw out a hook from the boat and catch hold of the shore and start pulling, do I pull the shore to me or do I pull myself to the shore? That's how prayer works. Prayer isn't pulling God to my will, rather it's aligning my will with the will of God. And I hope at this moment you're absolutely sure that if you were to die right now, right this minute, that you're positive that you would go to heaven. If you are, hallelujah, that's great. If not, then I invite you to come see me after the service and I'm going to try my best to show you how to be sure. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, you're, you're, you're amazing. You're amazing in the, the way you do things and the way you have everything all plotted out. And here we are, going along merrily, saying, well, I can do that. And I can do that. Yeah, I can, I can do that too. But then we hit the wall. 
and we wonder why. Friends, trying to follow God's will is no easy task. Because it's a whole lot easier when we do it our way, right? But that's not what God wants for us. God wants for us to have a joyous and happy life. A life filled with His grace and His mercy and His love and His forgiveness because we're going to mess up. But that's the great thing about God. He's just full of second chances. Or if you want to put it this way, He gives us a mulligan every day. A do-over. So Lord, as we prepare to celebrate this Holy Eucharist, help us to clear our minds, to prepare us to participate in this banquet here on earth. Help us to take these elements of, of bread and juice and allow them to strengthen us as we go about our individual journeys. And we pray all this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Christ the Lord invites us to his table, all who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. So therefore, let us confess our sin before God and before one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors, and we have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's just take a brief moment to recollect those times in the near past where we haven't done God's will. Friends, hear the good news that Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that just proves God's enormous, immense love toward us. So in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory, Glory to God. God. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. And. 
and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join now in their unending name by saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism and the suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread. He broke the bread, prayed to his father, and said, Friends, take this bread and eat it. And whenever you do so, do so in remembrance of me. When the supper was finished, he took the cup and again he gave thanks to his father. He gave it to the disciples, his friends, and said, Friends, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant poured out for you and for the many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of this, do so in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we now proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on all of us gathered here this morning and on these gifts of bread and juice. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we might be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory, and we have the opportunity to feast at his heavenly banquet. For it's through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. The table is set. All are welcome. It doesn't matter who you are. There's just a small condition that you love Christ and you don't mind sharing with each other. So I invite you to come now. Come with an open heart. Enjoy in your heart and a smile on your face.
goodness shared with each one of you. Amen. 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 Please rise if you're able and join in our closing hymn.
Many of you were uh, under the impression that today was going to be my last service. Wrong. <laughs> I'm not committing to another day because every time I do it changes. <laughs> but what I am committing to and what I have not committed to in the past is following God's will and not mine. This has all been my will and my doing and I commit in front of you as witnesses that when I say the final goodbye, it's God's will, not my own. So go now, filled with God's peace, love, grace, mercy, and joy. And make the world a different place. Don't forget to vote. Have a great week, everyone. God bless you all.